Let's heed the words of that hymn. Let us come and adore him in prayer. Let us pray together. O Lord, our God, our Savior, our King, we come before you this morning and we are so thankful, O Lord, that we can come together in fellowship one with another. And that we can come together in fellowship one with another because we have reason to fellowship with one another. And that reason is to unite our hearts, to unite our thoughts, to unite our very selves together as the body of Christ in response to all that you have done for us in the person of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father God, we pray that as we come into this place this morning, O Lord, that we would truly come in with an attitude of coming and adoring our servant king. And so, Father God, right at the very start of this morning's time together, we pray, O oh Lord, that, that you would take our thoughts off anything that would hinder, anything that would draw us away from focusing on Christ, and that you would place our thoughts completely and squarely and totally on Jesus. And so, Father God, to that end, we commit ourselves to you. I commit my words to you this morning, O Lord. The words that I have prepared, the, the fallible words of man, Lord God, I commit them to your use as I seek to explain the infallible word, the powerful, the inspired, and the, the word of God without error. And I pray, O Lord God, that as as I speak, seek to speak in a feeling way this morning, that your word would speak in power. Father God, I pray that you would give each of us ears to hear as your spirit would speak to us. I pray that you would not only give us ears to hear, but you would give us minds to receive and hearts to respond. And Father God, I pray that as we seek to begin this study this morning on the gospel of Mark, that you truly, Lord God, would reveal the person of Christ to us in power. Be with each and every one of us. We pray this, these things now in Jesus' name, for there is no greater name or higher name or better name by whom we can ask these things. And so, Father God, help us to surrender ourselves to you and help us to worship you as we come before you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. So folks, as, uh, as I announced last week uh, and have said a number of times this morning, this, uh, this morning we will embark uh, on a series which will be a, a slightly longer series than we've embarked on before in my time here, uh, th going through the gospel of Mark, looking at the person of Christ in the gospel of Mark. How we'll do this is uh, we'll not probably go through it all in one uh, week after week, uh, but we'll, we'll take times, different times this year, and we'll pick up on this wonderful gospel of Mark. Uh, and so, without further ado, let us turn uh, to the New Testament, uh, to the second book of the New Testament, uh, to the second gospel of the New Testament, uh, the gospel of Mark. And as you can, as you turn there, uh, let me just draw our attention as well to, uh, to the, the, the title that I've placed upon this whole series, uh, which is Mark the Gospel of the Servant King. Because throughout the Gospel of Mark, we will see Jesus highlighted, his identity highlighted in these two ways. We'll see his character and his person highlighted in many different ways. But overarchingly, we'll see Christ's character highlighted as both king and as servant, as the one who rules, and as the one who serves. And so let's read Mark chapter 1. Uh, we'll read verses 1 to 15 this morning uh, as we begin this study in Mark. This is the word of the Lord to us. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. 
to make his paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea, all Jerusalem, were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit then immediately drove him into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And we'll end our reading there uh, at the end of fifth, verse 15 uh, this morning. Let me uh, come before the Lord. Let us all come before the Lord in prayer, uh, seeking help as we come to his word. Let's pray. Father God, we pray this morning that your word would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We pray these things, this in the power of the Holy Spirit who inspired these words. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I don't know if, uh, if you're a fan of, of uh, the genre known as crime drama, whether it's uh, crime in, uh, in writing and literature, or, or whether it's crime drama on the TV. Uh, some of you will know what I'm talking about. Some of you uh, maybe won't know what I'm talking about. But uh, this idea, this genre of, of crime drama has been around and has been very popular for, for quite a while now. And generally, the whole point of this, uh, this genre of, of crime drama is that uh, at the start of a book or a program, a, a crime is committed, a pretty serious crime. Uh, and this crime is committed right at the start of, uh, of, the, of the program or the book. And then we see the detectives in the, the story uh, beginning to, uh, to go about detecting or investigating. Maybe that's a better word investigating this crime in order to find the one responsible. And then there's generally in this, these crime, drama, crime dramas, there's generally a, a big reveal right at the very end of who the perpetrator of the crime is or, or was. Usually a big shocking reveal. Maybe as I'm speaking now, you're thinking of, uh, of a TV program along the lines of something like Poirot. I think that's how you pronounce it anyway. Poirot, where uh, at the very start, uh, this crime was committed and, and Poirot, uh, he went about investigating and then right at the very end, he, he generally, amongst a big group of people, revealed who it was who had committed the crime. But there's another type of crime drama or another uh, way that these crime dramas are, 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 are put out as well. Because maybe as I was talking, you weren't thinking about something like Poirot. Maybe some of you don't even know who Poirot is. But maybe you were thinking something more along the lines of, of Colombo. Colombo, which was popular a number of years ago as well, where, where at the very start, we find out who it was that committed the crime. Who it was that, uh, that, 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 that committed the crime. I was going to say something else, but we'll, we'll just keep it uh, in those terms. And during the show, we know who committed the crime, but Colombo doesn't. And he seeks in his, uh, in his quirky, bumbling uh, way to try and figure out who it was who committed the crime. So you have two different types of, of crime drama. You have the one where, where we know who it is at the very start who committed the crime. 
And we have the one that takes us on the journey of finding out who it was that committed the crime. Well, Mark, why do I start there? Well, Mark is a little bit like Columbo in that right at the very beginning of his gospel, he tells us exactly what his gospel or who his gospel is about. Mark leaves it right at the start. He leaves us in, in absolutely no doubt what he's going to be teaching about, what he's going to be writing about, what he's going to be sharing about, who he's going to be pointing towards. And so he does that at the very start. And then really the rest of Mark's gospel really fills in that identity. So right at the very start, Mark says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then the rest of his gospel, he spends really unpacking what that means. Taking the reader on a, on a journey through what that means exactly. Just a few uh, as we come in, we're, I have four things I want to think about in particular uh, this morning. I want to think about the fact, I want to look at the, the preparing of the way uh, for the servant king. Uh, I want to look uh, at the, the performing of the baptism of the servant king, uh, the, the persevering, the, the servant king's persevering through temptation, and the proclaiming of the servant king's message. I want to look at those four things this morning, but just as we come to this this gospel this morning. I think it's, it's helpful just for a few brief moments just to think about who actually wrote this and maybe why he wrote this. This gospel was written by a man called John Mark. He was a, an associate. If, you, if you've read the book of Acts, if you know the book of Acts and some of Paul's letters as well, John Mark has been referred, by, referred to by Paul and by others. And John Mark, he was an associate of, of Paul who, who, who left Paul. He, he journeyed with Paul. He, he was a missionary with Paul. But something happened between Paul and John Mark, and the two of them separated ways. The two of them parted ways. And Paul seemed disappointed in John Mark, or we'll refer to him as Mark just. Paul, Paul seemed disappointed in Mark. And yet right at the very end of Paul's ministry, as he's writing, he says that uh, he, he wants Paul Mark to come to him to see him. Because he sees John, Paul Mark isn't the right person, John Mark. He sees John Mark as important to his ministry. And as important not only to Paul's ministry, but important in and to the kingdom of God. The gospel of Mark is probably the first gospel to have been written. It's the shortest gospel uh, with only 16 chapters. Uh, and Mark wrote this gospel really for for Christians who are facing mounting pressure in the face of Roman oppression. And so uh, he wanted to, to outline really short, in a really short and snappy way, who Christ was, who Christ is, and what that means for the church and for Christians. And so Mark wrote this gospel. As, as he wrote this gospel, Mark wanted to, to do that. He wanted to paint a picture of who Jesus was. And as he painted the picture of who Jesus was, he wanted to, to include in that picture what Jesus came to do and why. And so the gospel of Mark, it focuses really more on uh, Jesus' actions, what Jesus did, rather than really what Jesus said. So what we'll hopefully see as we dip in, in and out of, of this gospel is we'll see Jesus Christ, the man, and his mission. We'll see Jesus Christ, the man, and his mission. And I suppose this morning we're, we're thinking about how Mark really grounds Jesus' identity. How Mark grounds himself in Jesus' identity as the son of God. And I think two of the things which we'll see as we try to delve into this series is is, is, comes from the title of the series. We'll see as we delve into this series firstly that, that Jesus is the king. He's the king who has authority to rule. He is the king who has authority to rule over all. He is the king who is sovereign over the whole world. He's the king, quite pointedly, I suppose, this morning. He's the king who is sovereign over us. Sitting in each of our seats here this morning sitting in this little town of Castle Derg, in this little country of Northern Ireland. Christ, the king who lived 2,000 years ago, was sovereign 
and has, a uh, has the power and authority to rule us. And secondly, we'll see as we delve into this series that, that Jesus is the servant. He's the, ser he's the king who would serve, and he's the servant who would rule. But Jesus is the servant who would lay down his life for the sake of others. And those two things are, are almost a little bit contradictory in the time period that we're thinking. You know, a king rules, he doesn't serve. And a servant serves, he doesn't rule. And yet in Christ, we see the amalgamation of a servant and a king in the person of Christ. Christ is the king. He is the servant of God who would lay down his life. And so we have that great verse in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And many of you will know it, maybe off by heart. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark showing how Jesus was revealing throughout the whole gospel. And we'll see this a little bit this morning as well. Mark is, is showing how Jesus is re revealing his, his identity. And how the people often miss the point. And that's quite an important thing to think about as we go through Mark's gospel. Jesus was revealing in all that he did. In all the places that he went, in all the people who he healed, in all the, the actions that he did, he was showing his identity as, as the one who is both servant and king. As the one come from God, the Messiah, the Christ. And yet very often, the people whom Jesus goes to completely misses the point. And even more poignantly for us, and importantly as we go through this gospel, is even those who were closest to Jesus missed the point of who he was as well. The disciples, the 12, who, who he called to follow him, who, who left everything to follow Jesus, even at times in this gospel, they miss Jesus' identity. They, they miss who Jesus is. They miss the point of why he has come. And so that's another reason that Mark writes, that we as the church, would be disciples who know Christ, who know his identity, who know his authority, and who knows the manner in which he served so that we may follow his example in serving each other and serving our God. And so Mark's account of the, the servant king, it's, it's really an account which has a real sense of urgency about it. The word immediately is, is used more times in the gospel of Mark than in the, the other three gospels combined. We'll see as we go through the gospel of Mark, this, this constant refrain, immediately Jesus, immediately Jesus, immediately they were going somewhere else, immediately they stepped off the boat and they were somewhere else, immediately, immediately. And there's this, there's this constant sense of, of, of urgency. Jesus is always moving or Mark is always following Jesus' actions to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. And I think we see that sense of urgency from right from the very beginning. For Matthew and, Ma Matthew and Luke, they, they both, you'll probably know, they both start way back with Jesus' ancestry. Such and such was the son of such and such, was the son of such and such, was the son of such and such. Whereas Mark just hits the ground running. He just says, this gospel I'm writing about Jesus Christ. He's going to be the central figure. He's going to be the central theme. He's going to be the central person, and you need, and I need, and the disciples needed to pay attention to who he is and what he has done. And so we see this urgency of Mark's urgency of pointing to the person of Jesus right from the very start. And we come to our first uh, thought, really, for this morning, uh, which is preparing the way. Because as Mark says, as he starts, this is the, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. One commentator has written that, that in this verse, we have the, the dawning of the gospel day. But Mark then, he doesn't immediately go to Jesus. He goes to someone else. And you'll see in your, uh, from verses uh, 2 to, uh, to really verses 8, there's someone else who... Mark talks about. 
as he begins his gospel, as he begins writing and unpacking the, the person of Jesus Christ, Mark starts not with Jesus, but with a man called John. In the Old Testament, in Malachi and in Isaiah, it's foretold that, that before the servant of the Lord comes, before the Messiah comes, before the Christ comes, someone else would come before him to prepare the way for him, to prepare the way for his ministry. And then, and so Mark quotes in verses 2 and 3 from the Old Testament, from Malachi and Isaiah, as I said. And then in verse 4, again, we have this sense of urgency of Mark. He doesn't say, and, and this is how these prophecies foretell John the Baptist. No, he just says simply in verse 4, John appeared. Someone is coming to prepare the way for the Lord. John appeared. And we see the urgency coming through again here. We know him as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. Uh, not that he was affiliated with the Baptist church, uh, but he simply had a ministry uh, of baptism, the baptism and preaching of, of repentance. Uh, and he was, he's referred to in scripture, he's referred to but as John the Baptist. And we know him as John the Baptist. And here John the Baptist is really described in a, in, in a peculiar sort of way. You know, if you read the, the, read the description of who he is, uh, everyone was coming out to John, verse 6. John was, John was clothed with camel's hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. When was the last time you ate locusts and wild honey? No, no one's answering. Okay, uh, that's probably a good thing. Uh, but, but that's how John the Baptist is described. He's, he's described as a man who was in the wilderness. He was baptizing. He spent most of his time uh, separated from, uh, from really uh, cultural life. And people from really the, the, the higher classes of society were coming to him to be baptized by him, this baptism of repentance. So he was separated from, uh, from the world to some degree. And he's dressed a little bit funny. Camel's hair and a leather belt. And as we read, it sounds like he has a bit of a, a funny sounding diet. He eats funny sounding things. And yet Jesus in Matthew's gospel says that among men, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. There's no one greater than John the Baptist. And folks, we could spend a full sermon. We could actually spend a full sermon series unpacking who John the Baptist is. We could spend a full uh, sermon series unpacking his importance in the, the mission of God and the mission of Christ. But uh, we won't, not now, at least. Really, this morning, our prime focus to do with John the Baptist is to see what his message is. To see what his message is. One commentator has written that, that repentance, I'm going to do some of the hard work here just very quickly. Repentance was the message of the baptizer reduced to a word. This man had a, had a single note as he preached. He only preached one thing. He preached repentance. Repentance from sin. And in John, the scene is being, or in Mark, sorry, here, the, or in John, yes, in uh, John, the person in the gospel of Mark, the scene is, is being set for the dawn of the gospel. God has been silent for over 400 years between Malachi, the, the, excuse me, the last prophet to speak in the Old Testament. Over 400 years, the, the people have experienced God's silence. He didn't speak a word. The people were in darkness. And that characterized the, uh, quite, uh, quite a lot of the, the Old Testament, the people in the Old Testament. They were, they were often walking in darkness. They were often uh, living in darkness. That is spiritual darkness. And then in the person of John, God breaks his silence. John is really the last of the, the Old Testament prophets. 400 years after Malachi spoke, after Malachi prophesied from God, John comes with the final message from God before the word himself would come in to the world. John preached the need to repent from sin. 
as I say, it was a, it was a, a single focused ministry. Repentance being the conscience, conscious act of turning away from sin and turning towards God. And repentance is a message that the world needed to hear 2,000 years ago. And repentance is really a message that the world needs to hear today. And so we see the way prepared. John was preaching repentance. But really he had no good news to bring. He was preaching that people were sinners. But he wasn't preaching that there was a way for people to be saved necessarily. And that is how John prepared the way for the Lord. For the dawn of the gospel would come. The bad news of sin would have the, the good news come, the good news of salvation, the good news of Christ, the good news that people could be saved from sin. And so John the Baptist, he prepared the way for the servant king. And then he also had the, the absolute privilege of performing the baptism of Jesus, performing the baptism of the servant king. The picture we see here is, uh, and let's try to set the scene in our mind's eyes, is one day John is, is baptizing, he's out in the wilderness, wilderness baptizing in the River Jordan. People are coming to be baptized, and as people come to be baptized, uh, John is, is bringing them down into the water and baptizing them. It's symbolically, uh, symbolically, this is an act of repentance. They're repenting from their sin, and, and John is preaching and speaking this message. After he, after me, sorry, comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he, the one who is coming after me, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John is baptizing. He's, he's immersing people in the water, and then all of a sudden, one comes walking down the banks of the River Jordan. The very one who he had been saying would come. Is coming down the banks. He's coming down to John. He's coming to the one who is baptizing. Saying there needs to be forgiveness of sin. And he comes as the one who himself can forgive sin. As God himself. John's baptism. Uh, well, what, let's just take a few moments and then think about what John's baptism was. Uh, John's baptism was uh, uh, an immersion in water, symbolically cleansing from sin. And maybe we should think about John's baptism, something like a, a provisional license. And I'll just bear with me as, I say, as we, we go through this. But if you've got a provisional driver's license, you don't have the complete privileges of all that a full driver's license brings to you. You can't drive on your own. You can't drive at the, the, the national speed limit, things like that. And so John's baptism was, was really a baptism that, that was a provisional baptism that pointed to an even greater reality of baptism that Jesus would bring. John baptized with the Holy, John baptized with water, but Jesus Christ would baptize with the Holy Spirit. John, he was performing an outward symbolic act of cleansing. But Jesus would perform the inward reality of cleansing from sin by purification through the Holy Spirit. But the question then arises, why was Jesus baptized? Why was Jesus baptized? He, he had no sin. We know when I preach often and I share often that, that Christ was perfectly pure. The Bible calls him the, uh, the, the pure lamb of God, the perfect, spotless, spotless, unblemished lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. So why was Jesus baptized? He had no need of repentance. Was this just a, really a bit of theater? Well, I don't think so. Jesus' baptism is really a, quite an important aspect of the beginning of his ministry. For just a few short years, uh, the whole sin of the world would be placed squarely 
upon the shoulders of the Prince of Peace. He would bear the sin uh, or sin, my sin and your sin. He would bear our sin in his own body on the tree and, and his sinless death would bring the power of inward cleansing by the Spirit of God. Jesus, as he was being baptized, he wasn't being baptized because he needed to repent of sin. He was being baptized because he was identifying himself with us who needs to repent of sin. He was identifying himself as, uh, 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 with those whose burden of sin he would bear. And the following events then point to something very similar. Jesus is revealing his identity. He's revealing that he is fully human. And he has come, he is fully human and yet fully divine. And he has come to bridge the gap between man and God. And then, as I say, the following events point to something very similar. We see after Jesus is baptized, after he uh, goes down into the water and he comes back up, the heavens are torn open. This isn't, uh, this, is a, this is a major event. This is a major spectacle for those who were there, for them to see, for them to experience, for them to, to be part of. Jesus comes up from the water and the heavens, the, the, the heavens are, are torn open. And the Spirit of God descends upon Jesus Christ like a dove. And the Father pronounces Jesus Christ the, the blessed Son. The son with whom, his son, with whom he is well pleased. And so what I want us to notice very briefly and very quickly is that at the beginning, at the inauguration of Jesus' earthly ministry, we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all present. They're all there. The Trinity is, is working together. And as they are working together, they're working out the, the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. As the Spirit descends upon Jesus, God speaks from heaven. Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus is empowered to serve. And he's given authority to rule. As the Spirit descends upon him, he's empowered to be the servant of the Lord. And as the Lord speaks, saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. He's given authority to rule. And so just as Jesus in his baptism was being identified with those whose burden of sin he would bear, immediately after his baptize, baptism, he's been identified as the servant king. The one who would, in his own body, bearing the sin of the world, become the ruler of the kingdom of God. Then as we... Uh, uh, as, as Jesus' baptism, as he identifies with, uh, with sinners, as he identifies with us. That's pointing forward as well to what baptism would represent for us. For in baptism for us, we are identifying ourselves with, with Christ and his death and resurrection. In, bap in all the baptism that we undergo, we're saying that Christ has, has made us new. That he has performed this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that we have been saved by the grace of our servant king. And so the way has been prepared. The, uh, the, the, the baptism has been performed. And immediately after this baptism. And this is a very snapshot view of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Immediately after Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit drives him out into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit drives him out into the wilderness. And so we see the servant king persevering through temptation. Persevering through temptation. There's somewhere else where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are present at the beginning. Here we see them in Mark's gospel. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are present at the beginning, the inauguration of Jesus' earthly ministry. 
But there's somewhere else where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are present at the beginning. And that is the beginning of all things. Genesis 1. Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, we see God. We see the Word of God. And we see the Spirit of God all present and active in the creation of the world. But what do we see after creation? What does we see as God places man, Adam and Eve, in the, the Garden of Eden? Well, we see that the enemy of God comes and tempts them. Satan comes and, and tempts Adam and Eve. And here, at the very beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, we see that Satan is, is up to his old tricks. He's coming and he's trying to tempt the one who God has put forth, has sent forth. Jesus, Adam, and Eve, they were tempted by Satan and, and God's perfect creation. And that's something that is very hard for us to picture, just how perfect creation was. We see Adam and Eve at the very start of the Bible, at the very start of history, they're tempted in God's perfect garden where they had ample supply. And here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we see him tempted in a wilderness where he had nothing. Jesus succeeds where Adam failed. For Adam and Eve gave in to the temptation of Satan, bringing about the fall of the whole world. But Jesus perseveres through this temptation, symbolically saying that here I am, here to restore the fallenness of all things. Jesus here has been identified and, and persevering through these temptations uh, of Satan for 40 days. He's been identified as the one who would overcome the devil. He's the one who would overcome sin and restore all that was broken at the fall. And the reason that I want to take time at the start in this introductory uh, thought in the Gospel of Mark the reason that I want to take time to, to think very briefly uh, to some extent about these things, about Jesus' baptism, about his temptation, is because these things are not insignificant details. Jesus' baptism is not insignificant. The temptation that Jesus faced at the hands of Satan is not insignificant. This is the beginning of the gospel. This is the, the central point of, of history, Jesus coming into the world, Jesus serving and ruling. This is what the Old Testament was pointing towards. And this ministry of Jesus is from where our hope springs. Jesus' mission as the servant king is what secures our future, secures our eternity. And these events, the baptism of Jesus Christ, the, the temptation of Jesus Christ, they're, they're, they're events which are identifying Jesus Christ as, as the promised Savior. The one foretold in the Old Testament. They're the one who are identifying Jesus as, as God's servant king, who is truly man, who is truly God. Who is the one with the power to overcome Satan. Who's the one with authority to, uh, to set all that had fallen into chaos back into order. And Christ's perseverance here of, of temptation then becomes our pattern. Just as Christ's baptism becomes our pattern for identification. Jesus' perseverance and temptation becomes our pattern. And temptation that we would face due to continually living in a fallen and sinful world. Jesus resisted. And so do we. Elsewhere in scripture it tells us that, that we are to, to, to resist the devil. And he will flee from us. And thankfully we don't do that in our own strength. We don't do that in our own power. We do that on the authority. We resist the devil. We resist sin with the authority of the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth to rule. And so we see Jesus, the way prepared for him. We see the baptism performed in him. 
We see the temptation through which he persevered. And finally, we get to verses 14 and 15. And we see the message which he would proclaim. The message which he would proclaim. Verse 14 and 15, John's message was repent. And Jesus' message in verse 15 is this. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so we see again how John's ministry prepared the way for Jesus. John's message was repent. And Jesus' message is repent and believe. Repent, turn from sin. Believe, turn to the gospel. And turn to Christ through the gospel. And it's with this message that we'll end this week. And we'll cut, bring, bring our, our time and God's word to a close this week. But it's also with this message that we will begin next week. For this is quite important for us. Believers and unbelievers alike continually need to hear this, this message of the, of the kingdom, which is repent and believe. For this message of Christ, the message that Christ proclaims, which is unpacked the whole way through Mark's gospel, is Christ's call to us by the, by the Holy Spirit. Turn from sin. Turn to Christ. Turn from sin and turn to Christ. Someone has described this as the gospel in a nutshell. These verses, this message of Jesus, they've described as the gospel in a nutshell. The bad news is that sin exists. And the wages of sin is death. And repentance from sin is necessary. But the good news is that Christ overcame sin and its power for us, giving life and bringing life to us. Just to end this week, I want to remind us that sin is no fickle matter. It's no matter of uh, insignificance in the life of anyone, not least in the life of the church. It's no fickle or insignificant matter because Christ was crushed because of sin. He bore in his own body on the cross the punishment that he did not deserve, but that I did and that you did. Sin crushed our Savior so that it might not need to crush us. And you may say that I have already repented and believed, and that's good. And I hope most of us, if not all of us, have done that. You might say that I have already repented and believed. What has this message of repentance and believing got to say to me today? Well, in the life of a Christian, repentance and believing in the gospel is an ongoing thing. It's not just a one-off event where we repent of our sin and believe. It's a daily commitment to our Savior. It's a daily commitment to our ser servant king. As we close this time before we go to communion, we'll sing a hymn, uh, a hymn that hopefully most of us will know. But one of the verses of this hymn says, this is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king so as we embark and as i close right now as we embark upon our study in mark's gospel and as we reflect on christ's call to repent and believe i think this is a good time for us to to draw inwardly ourselves and reflect on a few questions one being am i daily repenting and turning away from the sin that continually resides within me? And secondly, am I daily believing and turning to Christ? One of the themes of Mark is discipleship, how we follow Christ closely. And this is the start of it, a daily repenting and a daily 
believe him. That's our introduction to Mark and Mark's gospel. And I have been praying and I've been excited actually begin to begin Mark's gospel. And I'm praying very strongly that this gospel would be a great blessing to each and every one of us as we see our Savior very clearly.